Welcome to the WAN Show, everyone. We've got a fantastic show for you here today. In fact, I was I was a little bit surprised because when we were going through the topics for this week uh, a couple days ago, I was like, oh, it's actually... not a ton, really. Yeah, well, compared to last week, yeah. when we had all the things to discuss, that was that was just like crazy as all balls. Uh, but this week is turning out to look actually pretty darn good. Our special guest today is Elric from Tech of Tomorrow, formerly from Motherboards. Org. Maybe we can poke him a little bit and see if we can get him to actually, you know what, let's not let's not dig up the past. Let's not dig up the past. But we've got Elric joining us today for our guest segment, and I'd love to do a preview of the topics we've got today. So number one, guys, is lock up your daughters and sons and um, badgers because yeah. Minecraft will turn your kids into gun-slinging, knife-toting, violent, violent people. I can't believe this got out. Minecraft. With GTA 5. Like, I know. <laughs> I like the timing is hilarious. The timing is fantastic. More on that later, guys. Oh. Cheating in Android benchmarks is definitely a thing. So we are going to discuss the state of the Android ecosystem and what cheating means to consumers and manufacturers and why it gets done when they get caught every time. This is the Why exact same bother? thing we've seen on the PC platform. We've seen it on the PC. We'll see it again on smart watches. Quote me on that. That's, that's true. What else we got? Uh, we've got control delete was a mistake admitted by Bill Gates. Kind of an interesting little conversation that happened there. <laughs> and steam machine specs unveiled by XI3 and Valve. And the, the Valve steam machine specs that were unveiled were the prototype ones that are going in. Kind of all over the place. So. And yeah, all over the place. All right. So why don't we kick things off with -da -ba, the intro. <laughs> Alright guys, so this week's episode of The WAN Show is brought to you by Hotspot Shield. You get 20% off elite prices with the offer code LINUS. You can sign up at bit.ly or bit.ly slash HS share and you will be among the, actually I talked to them today, you will be among the 430 Linus Tech Tips viewers so far that have already signed up with them, which is pretty cool. There was one post on the forum from someone that had an issue with customer service and within a matter of, I think it was about a day, Hotspot Shield had posted on our forum, fixed it with them, posted their email address for any other Linus Tech Tips viewers that had any kind of issues with the service. So that uh, I thought That's that cool. was I thought that was pretty I cool. Got an industry affiliate them. Yeah, I haven't done we that. should probably do. I haven't, I haven't told you about. <laughs> I was like, I <laughs> I didn't hear about this. <laughs> no, don't worry, don't worry, we got okay. this. Anyway, guys, twenty percent <laughs> off elite prices. So bit.ly slash hs share. So let's move into our first news item of the week, which is actually a pretty minor a pretty minor item. It's just yeah. more of a funny thing. Yeah. It's so Bill Gates admits, this was posted on the forum by Snow Comet. Bill Gates admits control alt delete was a mistake and blames IBM. <laughs> so first of all, control alt delete as far as key combinations go. I mean, that's kind of like saying alt F4 was a mistake, except that it's not because control alt delete in, in Microsoft's mind should have been one button. Yeah. And at the time the functionality was to restart your computer. Um, it's evolved over time and we still have it today. And then the other functionality, of course, at the time was to prove that you were a human being sitting in front of a computer. Now, from a security standpoint... That's not a very good proof. <laughs> was, it, was it ever effective, though? Uh, I, I can't see a way that it could have been but maybe someone better than me knows a way that it could have been. Because I, from my standpoint, you can just, you can just mimic those key presses. So, like, it's not a big deal. So Control-Alt-Delete, if they'd had their way, would have been a single button, which would have saved us how many billions of keystrokes over the last few years. Um, basically, the original article was from The Verge, so you can go ahead and check it out over there. But pretty much he was giving a talk, and everyone kind of had a good laugh about it. The IBM keyboard designer just kind of refused to <laughs> refused to implement it. Which, which I, honestly, in my opinion, I have no real problem with. Like, it's, it's the least big deal 
ever. Yeah, we just thought that was kind of funny, so we're not going to spend too much time on it. Let's go ahead and move into our next topic. It's, I, I don't know, it's just, I, I think the thing about it that sticks out most to me is how these legacy things just keep carrying forward yeah, and carrying yeah. forward to the point where control delete has very different functionality today and you have to basically be in the bios or in like a pre windows environment for it to even reboot your computer but what you can do is you can bring up the task manager you can lock the computer and there's um and some places still use it to authenticate that it is an actual user yep, sitting in yep. front of the pc so. uh server login you yep. still have to control delete Server logins. Um, uh, one thing I think is interesting though is is like if if that didn't happen, if the mistake quote unquote didn't happen, how many like key things? Like there's so many people I know that can do it without looking, without having hands on the keyboard and just go boom and just hit it. <laughs> and like they, they, there was that thing before where someone made a fake little keyboard that was just Control Delete, and they were like, "This is all you need to use Windows." Like all that stuff, the like the like cult following that Control Delete has. To be completely honest, like. Well, if they had one key, if there was like the... Would uh, it have been the same, though? If there was like the O-Balls key or something like that, that might, <laughs> that might have been all right. Probably, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, we love it. Uh, let's go ahead and move into our next topic. This is actually one that is... Um, that hits pretty close to home for me because here, <laughs> in, here in Canada, we have... Um, Oh, no, I actually was going to go, okay, let's talk about a couple different things that are going on with <laughs> smartphones in the EU. Okay. So this isn't exactly new, but I just, I just want to talk about this because it's something that I personally feel quite strongly about, and that is that the EU, this was on BBC, plans to end mobile phone roaming charges. So this would be implemented by 2016, and in 2014, it would be eliminating roaming charges for incoming calls. And as someone who lives in Canada, we don't have the greatest mobile phone rates. We also don't have the worst ones. I mean, nope. I pay about $100 a month for my business plan that includes five gigs of data, basically unlimited calling for all intents and purposes. It includes US calling, when I'm at home, which is great because you'd be amazed how many people just don't want to bother with Skype and want to talk on the phone. And most of the people we work with are in the US. So I would be paying a fortune in long distance if I didn't have that kind of a plan. And it's really not that bad. It's a hundred bucks a month. But the thing that kills you, so I was over in Hawaii for about eight days, $6 a meg. Ugh. is the roaming charge. I think it's something like 75 cents a text. And to me, the uh, this is this is this is basically like to me the only excuse for this kind of behavior and these kinds of charges is like, you know, the back room of, you know, uh, a lady club where there's like fat dudes with cigars sitting around going like you know, like placing bets on the table for how much they think that people would be willing to pay in roaming <laughs> charges. And I mean, even roaming plans where it's like, yeah, $50 gets you, you know, a, a, a one hundredth of what you normally have access to with your regular plan while you're on the go. There's no reason that it has to be done. And I really applaud the EU for being progressively thinking when it comes to these infrastructure items that, that I think unify people and I think they make they make travel and they make the, the global economy more more of a thing where travel can become less expensive um, in, in every way whether it's whether it's planes or trains or hyperloops or you know. <laughs> okay so Elon Musk isn't building the hyperloop but I, uh, I anyway I, I really I really admire that I think it's fantastic there's interesting stuff too because you'd automatically think when you go roaming somewhere that you should pre-purchase the roaming plan because it'll save you all the danger one of my friends when went down to PAX, pre-purchased the roaming plan. It was $40. Yeah. I didn't. Took all the hits and was still totally fine and under $40. It was still really expensive and stupid. So it's just like, would you like to bend over the couch or would you like to bend over the bed? It's totally up to you as long as you bend over and take it from your telco. Yeah. Um, now, there are challenges associated with this because you're asking for telcos to cooperate. Uh, in the EU, it's going to require uh, wireless providers to have, I think, it, yeah, the proposals must be approved by the 28 EU members and they also have to have permission to, to 
operate and, and conduct business, so to speak, in all of those countries, I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation in the market where yeah. the, the, the large players in the larger markets, whether it's Germany or uh, the UK, are going to have a huge leg up on the smaller providers in the smaller EU countries. And I think it's going to put a lot of people out of business. And there are problems with all of this, but uh, I think that it has to happen at some point and I would love it if even Canada and US got together yeah. and cooperated. I'm surprised it, it hasn't happened yet. Well of course it hasn't happened because whether it's Verizon or Bell or Rogers or AT&T they all love damn roaming charges. That's true. They all but, but love it. But with everything else that Canada and US does together I'm actually kind of surprised that's not one of them. Well, it's it's one of those things where it takes a government mandate to yeah. make telcos cooperate with each other. Have you seen... Or well, cooperate with each other above board. Right, right. So H Have you seen all that stuff lately, the Canadian government attacking wireless companies? Uh, their web page, whatnot, whatnot. I didn't bother to put that in the thing because we've talked too much. We've talked a lot enough about that. But like, it's, it's yeah, they're kind of mad. Yeah, good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I'm glad we need more government regulation on the telecommunications guys because it is getting ridiculous. So speaking of government regulations and sometimes them getting involved in things that they <laughs> don't fully understand, uh, this one is new. It was posted by Bam Bam Lolly on the forum. The EU wants every smartphone and tablet to charge by micro USB. So the original article was on The Verge as posted by our our forum member who is helpfully putting in his sources. And I agree with the idea <laughs> that every smartphone should use a universal standard. But what I disagree with is that the that micro USB should be it. So um, let's, let's get into it, shall we? I'm just, just go. <laughs> I'm just up. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna start this by saying I've been called out a little bit over the last week or so because I did tweet about this a little bit where people are saying, okay, well Linus's quotes about how fragile micro USB is are from some company that didn't have it validated by a third party and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's set aside the quotes for now. Guys, hit us on Twitter. Simple yes, no. Have you ever had a micro USB connection Fail. I want that to be the first answer. And then yes, no. Have you ever had a full size USB or a mini B connection fail? So your, your post should read uh, no, no, if you've never had anything fail. Yes, no, if you've had this one and not this one. And yes, yes, if you've had both of them fail. Guys, hit us on Twitter. We're going to go through your thoughts. But my problem is I have personally had micro USB fail and not, okay, it's validated. I'm not, I'll let you talk in a minute. It's validated <laughs> for a thousand plugs or something like that. The problem I have is how fragile physically the connector is. It can be validated for whatever you want. But in the real world, we don't carefully plug it in and unplug it. We don't even plug it in quickly straight and unplug it straight. We run into situations where our phones are dead, we really need a charge, we're on the go, we take a portable battery bank, we plug it into it, we jam the whole thing in our pocket. That is the real world, especially in this day and age of cell phones that don't last for a week on battery like they did when I first got a cell phone. We have moved so far backwards to the point where when I'm heavily using my HTC One, I might have to charge it a couple times in a day. I'm talking really heavy use. I burned through 20% of my battery in about 15 minutes today when yeah. I had tethering on and I was using it for navigation and the, the, the screen was on. They go fast. So micro USB is fragile even if it is reliable or whatever other term you want to use for it lasting a long time. So with all of that said, I don't have an alternative connector I like better. I, I actually, well, okay, I don't think mini USB-B was that bad. If you actually objectively look at them and compare them, they are not that bad different. The only real difference on a modern cell phone implementation, even on something like the HTC One, would be that you'd get less of less less of a, of, of a sort of support around it, which I find that that connector doesn't need as much. With that said, the internals of the connector are bulkier. <sighs> but they could have moved it closer to the center and that could have still worked. So, okay, maybe, maybe Mini B isn't the answer, but I would rather they develop a more rugged standard as opposed to just making the, making it uh, standardize on this fragile connector. To play against your 
question that you're putting on Twitter. A USB like standard USB is obviously I know, a lot huge. better and I know. could never be put on a phone yes. and that's ridiculous. So that doesn't matter. Phone blocks, my magical phone, could have like an interface module. <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> that would be awesome if you could be like, no, this is my power connector. Um, I want to use an AC wall outlet. <laughs> Bulkiness of the phone be damned. It's going to be this thick and it's going to run on AC power. Okay. Like standard computer power. Yeah. Uh, anyways. Um, <laughs> And then mini B, like no one ever uses. So your metric there. It used to micro, be the standard. Micro USB is going to have every, a whole bunch of people that use it. Every camera. And a whole bunch of people using it for different devices. Every and camera mini was B mini B. Mini B is going to have a tiny, much smaller. Well, it's pool dead of now, but it used to be much more popular. And it was than mainly micro. on cameras. cameras. Yes, which were the portable electronics of the and time. And not nearly as many people had a freaking camera as they have smartphones. So the metrics do not line up. So your one side is has way more population than your other side, and it's not a fair competition. Okay, fine. And you know what? I'm going to devil's advocate myself a little bit here because I did run into a situation this very week twice where I found myself wishing that my Pebble, which is awesome, by the way, doesn't have micro USB. I lost the magnetic connector, which is awesome, and I love magnetic Aww. chargers. I lost it twice. Once, when I wanted to shoot the original unboxing, I had left it at home, and I was like, oh, balls, because I could have run around anywhere in the, in the studio here and grabbed a micro USB cable, chucked it in the box, and pretended that was the one it came with, and it would have saved me a lot of time. But I couldn't, because it uses a proprietary cable. And then again, when Brandon needed to shoot the B-roll for it. <laughs> but, then, but then, in your defense, you're not against the unification of the cable. No. It's, you're against micro USB, so oh, that's not if, actually... If we could have, like, a magnetic... USB standard yeah, cable. Yeah. So that's not really like that's not really a point against. Bring it either. on because there will be teething pains in any transition. I mean, micro USBs. Remember when we never used to have enough of those? Yeah. Um, there will be teething pains, but if we could have a standard that that just falls away when you trip on it, like a magnetic connector, that would be amazing. Be yeah. Amazing. All right. So let's go ahead and see what kind of results we got on that there Twitter blitz. I don't know how many people have followed the instructions because a lot of people are just like, oh, they're doing a Twitter blitz. I'll use this as an opportunity to say something completely unrelated oh it all seems right to be working pretty well. so there we go people hey people are people are doing it so we've got wow this browser is being a big giant pile of poo it is lagging out so hard all right so yes no uh no no wow yeah, you know, i can't i can't even do this uh, um, so so far of the people who haven't had like nothing die on them we have three for micro and one for mini we have another no for both we have Twitter being, or not Twitter, but Chrome being a big pile of junk. All right, another one for micro, another one for micro. No for both. Micro, but not mini. No for both. Yes to both. No micro, but yes mini. That's yes to micro, no to mini. Yes to micro, no to mini. So, okay. Let's say, let's say, yeah, and it's, it's lagging out again. This is, this is ridiculous. We're going to have to switch browsers. We'll find some time to do that in a moment. But mostly... You guys are saying that micro USB breaks on you more often, but again, as Luke was saying, um, yeah, it's skewed because there's a much larger, much larger install base for micro. That being said, I've used a lot of both, and I've only had micro USB fail on me. And like I, just, I'm just. For me, the problem isn't the cable so much as the receptacle. Yeah. And on something like a phone, where we're talking a $600 plus piece of electronics, where it has this one failure point, where if it if you if you bump it once, it's completely dead, and there's no and, repairing it. Yeah. And and like every once in a while, you'll find that device that comes with a cable, and that device and that cable like click together, and it feels really good, and you're yeah. like, oh, this can be solid forever, and it is. And then you go to plug in like a random USB or even the one that comes with your phone. I found sometimes, and you plug it in, and you can like move the whole phone like oscillating around where the actual plug is in is like that's not gonna work for very long <laughs> it's like oh come on <laughs> like i don't know you can see it coming a lot of the time and then then like you said putting it in your pocket kills it a lot of time too all right so let's do one more major topic before we bring our guest on apparently you didn't even get back to them about having not done the test call do you do you have them added on uh i thought i sent on voice that. chat okay yes. if you have to go bail for a couple minutes and i'll handle this topic on my own and make sure you just kind of get that figured out i just replied to the email so here we go guys parents 
actually, you know what? I'll save that one. I'll save that one to talk about with you. All right, this was a post on the forum a long time ago, and kind of a funny story here was um, <laughs> Slick's been using the priority inbox in Gmail <laughs> um, basically since Linus Media Group was formed and only realized this week that, I don't know, what would you say, about half of the emails you get from me? have not been being flagged as priority. So got at least, at least 25%. At, okay, so let's say at least a quarter of them. So guys, priority inbox, if you don't already know, I really don't recommend using it. I found it makes a lot of things escape from you. I just... um, <laughs> So, oh, okay, you weren't CC'd, I guess, so that's a bit of a problem. So, basically, this article was actually posted on the Linus Tech Tips forum by Queek back in June. And it was something that I emailed. I was like, hey, we should, uh, we should talk about this on the WAN show. So, load line calibration or VDroop... Um, Sort of V-droop compensation is something that many motherboard manufacturers have implemented in order to potentially stabilize overclocks. However, it's one of those things where the motherboard manufacturers put it on there. Extreme overclockers do tend to use the setting from time to time. But if you ask most of the motherboard guys or you ask Intel, they'll say, well, you know what? It's part of the Intel spec, so we'd really recommend that you leave it on. And what happens is when your CPU goes under load, the motherboard actually drops the amount of voltage it's delivering to the CPU. This does a couple of things. It reduces heat output, and it also improves longevity of the CPU and reduces power consumption. The flip side of that is if you set a voltage to your CPU with the objective of making it stable at higher clock speeds, like if you're overclocking, you don't necessarily want your motherboard dropping the voltage when you're in a load uh, under a heavy load or intensive situation because well I told you I wanted the voltage and I wanted the power and you're turning it off on me so this article was just done by one of our forum members it's not the most scientific thing I've ever seen but basically he took some time and used a Rampage 4 Extreme and a 3930K to test with a digital multimeter, what the actual settings were, uh, what was actually being delivered to his CPU on that board with different load line calibration settings, and I thought it was absolutely fascinating just because there's some pretty interesting stuff going on. It has a huge effect on the voltages that your CPUs are going to be running at, whether it's, uh, whether it's at idle or whether it's at load, and it is definitely worth a read. It'll be posted in the WAN Show document after the show, but if not, you can always search on the forum for load-line calibration, why overclockers should care, and you can check out that article. Little little tip, if, you're, if you want to search on the forum, just go to Google and do like Linus Tech Tips and then load line calibration forum and it'll probably come up better because our search sucks i um, know the search is terrible it is we're hoping that they fix it in ips version 4 which is in alpha right now and we will not be beta testing yeah no more <laughs> beta testing forum software um you know what we've got a little bit more time so warcraft the movie is coming out on december 18th oh. okay there's a couple different ways this can go. People yep. were stoked so hard on, what was it, Advent Children or whatever they called that first Final Fantasy movie. Uh, what was it? Yeah, I, that was at least one of them. I can't remember. I don't know if that was the first one. I, I yeah. watched about 30% of it, and I was like, this is the most boring, stupid thing that I've ever seen. I kind of expected that. The CG... Okay, the, okay, the problem is that, okay, at that time, I hadn't played a Final Fantasy game since, like, Final Fantasy VI. So I was expecting mm. a story that wasn't just, like, the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> um, like, I, I was expecting it to be more than just a tech demo, and it really wasn't. I was incredibly disappointed. I was at a friend's house, and we were watching it together, and I was just like, I'm gonna go play Sims. And that was the one time I ever sat down and played The Sims, because <laughs> I was that bored. Was, was that, I, I can't remember the names, because I'm derping right now, but was that the Final Fantasy movie where she has to go find, uh, she's trying to find plant life? I don't even remember, man. Like, <laughs> it was terrible. I didn't mind the one where she has to go find plant life. So, Warcraft movie could end up being, like, just a, a tech demo for CGI and, um... But it's Blizzard. But it's Blizzard. So... It also could end up having like the best story ever and launching an, en an entire series of movies and a franchise yeah. that could be amazing. I'm a huge fan of the Warcraft lore. 
Like, I love the Warcraft lore. And I linked something in this document so you guys can check it out later, which is a compilation of HD remakes of all of the cinematics, not like cutscenes, but cinematics from Warcraft 3. And like, they're epic. Everything's okay. epic. Like when 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 Arthas is succeeding you and stabs you the guy's thing and his crown rolls down the stairs. Like that's so ridiculously epic. And I expect it to be more like fighting and war and epic scenes and stuff like that than I would expect from the Final Fantasy. So series. if someone could pull this off, would it be Blizzard then? I, I think so, because we also saw um okay, Prince of Persia. Because Square's whole thing was was cinematics and being awesome at yep. cutscenes and making them epic even though you know the games themselves particularly these days don't necessarily have but a whole lot of meat to them see but then they've been moving away from that and they've been moving away from that so so okay and and, and like um there, there was prince of persia okay but then prince of persia i think tried to be its own thing too much okay and this, I think they're just gonna embrace it and be like, nope, this is Warcraft. Well, and Blizzard's good at else. Blizzard's good at that. I mean, you know what? This was actually uh, when I when I was oh man, it was awesome when I was just kind of hanging out, having drinks with Chris Roberts. Yeah, that happened. I don't think I told you <laughs> I that yet. We haven't talked much about this. I'm like, I told you an email. It's probably the most jelly I've ever been. So anyway, so he was all like, yeah, you know, I think the thing we did wrong on the Wing Commander movie was that. We tried too hard to make it its own thing. Yeah. Instead of just you making just need it, to embrace your community. Making it Wing Commander. So if if Blizzard does this, um, starring Colin Farrell, which is going to be uh, which is going to be awesome. I have eventually. a feeling it's going to just be all voice actors though. December eighteenth, twenty fifteen. I'll go see it. Yeah, me too. I don't think I've seen a movie on launch day since Avatar, and before that, oh no, I did see uh, Deathly Hallows on launch day. Deathly Hallows Part 2. Return of the King? No. No, I think that was me. Yeah, okay, so I that was your that last was, one? I think so. Okay, well, here, why don't we make a pact? Let's go see this. Sure. We'll get a big group together. We'll go sure. all the Linus, we'll have a Linus Media Group outing, and we'll go see the Warcraft Sweet. movie. <laughs> Guys, um, are you as stoked as us on this? I gotta get the Twitch chat going on my laptop here, because I am... I am, I am just, I'm sorry guys, I've abandoned you here. I just, like, yeah, seriously. Like, the amount of time that I've spent playing Warcraft 3 and the amount of time that I've spent playing WoW should be, like, criminal. Are we ready for our special guest? I'm, I'm still waiting for the friend request, and then we'll be good to go. <laughs> um, All right. He's jumping on right now, so it shouldn't be too long. All right, jumping on right now. Why don't we go ahead and just go for our one troll this probably news won't item? Take that long. I, th I really don't think this is going to take that long. <laughs> Half Life Three confirmed. Huh? huh? So they registered a trademark for Half Life Three, but yeah. it's just trademarking the name. And at an almost exact same time, they registered the the Steam symbol in in the EU. <laughs> so so. I personally think it's just trying to drive hype towards Valve. I think it has nothing to do with anything, and I think anyone who's reading anything into this other than they don't want someone else to make the game Half-Life 3 and be put in a position where they can't really say anything about it, I think that's all that's going on right now. Um, yeah. 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 I, I honestly think it, it, like, you're definitely right. I think it, it might have had something to do with the timing of the other stuff that's going on because it, it oh, drove gosh. a huge amount of more interaction to go along with their Steam box and all this kind of stuff because even in that thread you can scroll down and see someone that posted a picture of Steam box with the controller with Half-Life 3 bundle, buy it for whatever, like, like there's, there's, it drove interaction directly for Steam box and the other, or Steam machine, sorry, and the other stuff that they're releasing, so... The timing may have been interesting, but they also just had to freaking patent the name because they had to. Right. Well, trademark <laughs> is different from patent, or, to be sorry, very yeah. clear, to yeah. be very clear. Um, so I, I actually do get a kick out of the fact that it's uh, a Newman avatar on the guy, the guy <laughs> who posted it on NeoGAF. So, yeah, yeah, the ultimate, ultimate troll avatar right there. How close are we here? I still hasn't added me up. Um, haven't gotten an email recently. 
All right, cool, cool, it's cool. Just getting set up. Hopefully, we'll have this going very, very soon. Uh, add me on Skype. Yep, I'll hopping on Skype in a second. Okay, that's good. So let's move along to. You know what, guys? Hit us with a Twitter blitz of maybe some questions for Elric. I'll take some time and uh, introduce him. If you aren't already familiar with Elric from Tech of Tomorrow, he's done a wide variety of different stuff. Uh, started up motherboards.org about one billion years ago. Without taking a crack at him for his age, uh, he's been doing the whole tech media thing for longer than I have known what a CPU is so the guy's got a ton of experience his new YouTube channel tech of tomorrow is actually growing faster than motherboards.org ever did and I think it really shows um, what creators are able to do when they shed the shackles of corporate involvement or when they aren't forced anymore to focus as much on uh, the business side of things and are instead allowed to focus on the creation side of things. I mean, we've seen similar success with Linus Tech Tips growing at a much faster rate than it used to be back when I had to deal with my full-time job. So Tech of Tomorrow is his show. Uh, he's on Twitter at... Uh, ooh, oh, balls. Okay, I can't remember, but... But if you search for Tech of Tomorrow Twitter on Google, which is actually how I usually find people because Twitter does a terrible job of autocomplete. You know what really, really drives me insane? This is like kind of an offshoot, but when you go on Twitter and type in, there's the search box and I'm like, Linus, and then press down once because it's currently searching for you and then press enter and it comes up with, instead of going to you, it just does like a search for, if I just did L-I-N-U, it would do a search for Linux. And it's like, no, actually, I want the thing that you were showing a millisecond previously, which was Linus. It's, oh man, there's some stuff about Twitter that drives me crazy. I have recently started using Instagram. Because really? Because Twitter pictures break constantly. You know what? I've actually found that too. There's better support when you click, especially on the mobile app. Yeah. When you click on a Twitter picture link, it just goes it nowhere. It doesn't work. So now if I use Instagram, it actually loads. Like I have no interest in actually using Instagram. I used to use it a long time ago. I didn't even bother making a new account. I was just like, whatever. <laughs> It'll work. And like, I, I don't want to promote it. I don't want to do anything. I don't care if anyone follows it because everything that I ever post on Instagram will always just push to Twitter. I have no interest because it's just the only reason why I'm using it is so it actually freaking load. All right, we've got another little bit of troll news here. This is uh, this is pretty funny. While well, we stall for time some more, so uh, are we are we ready to rock? Yeah, okay, yeah. so get things get things going over there. We need our headsets, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> on Indiegogo, the AI oh. smartwatch is uh, is a is a smartwatch that I I watched their I watched their video about sort of two minutes in, and I kind of went, yeah, okay. You know what? The real secret to a successful Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign seems to have less to do with the idea and the product and more to do with having a really slick video. And I was yeah. looking at it going, yeah, really, guys, I don't know if... Uh I don't know if this is going to work. So what we got a kick out of, and this was pointed out by one of our community members, was that it is as featured in, whoa, hold on a second, what's that down there? What's, what's this right here? As featured in Linus Tech Tips. So Luke's looking at this going, what? I don't remember this. <laughs> I, I don't remember making a video about this. You know what's funny too is I watched the uh, video and um, it was just, it was music that we paid for off Melody Loops, but yeah. they used the same the music same, yeah. that we use in one of our Tech Quickie videos in their Indiegogo video. I recognize that as well. Um, so what it turned out to actually be was a, uh, a, a post on the Linus Tech Tips forum that like one dude who looks like a legit member of the forum, is, so it's, yep, it's not just is. them, it's You Better Not, who I've seen around like 2,000 posts saying, oh, that's pretty cool, but that small interface, and then nobody ever replied. <laughs> And but it's that, like it's not even a bad post, just no nope, one ended up replying. No, nope, good post, just um, it wasn't really featured on Linus Tech Tips in the same way that that Indiegogo page would imply that it was featured on Linus Tech Tips. So we're getting our call with Elric going. I've had the pleasure of meeting Elric a couple times. The first time we met in person was at CES this year, and I remember us say, saying, hey, we gotta, you know, get together and like, do something and then we just never managed to make it happen so is he is he on are yep. we good are yep. we live I, I, i'm here hey, hey! welcome What's to up, the guys? show all right 
So I kind of introduced you a little bit, but why don't you tell the audience what you're about as if any of them don't know who you are already, because I'm pretty sure they do. I don't know, man. I'm like the, I feel like the old man in the tech business. I've been doing this like <laughs> since the day it started. Um, I've been into gaming and computers and electronics ever since I was a little kid. So like doing this for me, it just seems to be like the natural way of my life. I really love doing what I'm doing and I don't really see myself doing anything else. And it's great to see so many other young people doing it nowadays. Like I've been doing it back when I was on like one or two sites. Now there's just so many people out there doing their own thing and it's just awesome. You know, a lot of people feel like guys like you and me or, um, you know, the Newegg TV guys or whatever are competitors. And I'd like you to take a moment and address that in your own words, because I think you put it pretty well. Yeah, I mean, there really is no competition between anybody. I'll admit that, like, when I first got into it, I used to kind of look around and look at everybody's numbers and wonder, you know, what I could do to get better and all this. But then I just kind of just started, like, doing my own thing, paying attention to what I was doing and learning really to, like, more and less buddy up with everybody. Um, for a long time, it seems like a lot of the PC people all wanted to be like an island. They just, you know, they were afraid to share any of their ideas, afraid to work together. And I've really noticed that over the years, the Mac guys have never done that. And so I really myself started adopting more of their kind of an outlook on things. Work with everybody, work together, and just be one big happy family instead of being an island all by yourself trying to do this. Absolutely. I agree 100%. I mean, it, it still kind of is funny to me when people post on my video that, you know, Elric's the best tech host, or they post on your video that Linus is the best. And you know what, guys, we really don't see it that way. Uh, we see ourselves as, and, and this is sort of my take on it, is that I see every other YouTuber who is doing tech on YouTube or making videos on YouTube and making a living out of it as a testament to the solidity of the platform and the legitimacy of what we're doing here. I think every other tech YouTuber that's approaching sponsors and trying to, you know, get sponsorship or, you know, get access to the samples that we need in order to bring you guys timely content is great because it brings attention to YouTube and to video that we otherwise wouldn't be getting if it was just one dude talking about it to them. So I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I just think it's funny because they leave comments like, oh, hey, he did it before you or so-and-so did it before you. And I see those same comments on their channels when I do, when they don't realize <laughs> that we all are just doing our own thing. And when it hits, it hits. Speaking of things that are hitting, this was an article that is on Tech Power Up. Now, I don't know what your NDA obligations are, but I do have some with respect to the upcoming Radeon graphics cards. So I want to keep the discussion pretty much narrowed in from my side on what I've already seen posted in other places. But Tech Power Up posted some benchmarks of the Radeon R9 290X, which we already know, this isn't under NDA, is going to be their new flagship card based on a new GPU. And we saw some interesting results here. So there's rumored specs in here as well, but we see it trading blows with the Titan. So give me, give me your thoughts on Radeon 290X. Well, for me, I'm just really glad to see AMD getting something that's new for the people that out there that have been supporting them. I mean, they've had their cards on the market for a long time. We did see the 7990 hit the market, but it doesn't seem like it got very favorable results since the price is like almost next to giving it away now compared to some of the cards that are coming out. But um, I'm really looking forward to it. And if these guys can actually get the price point down below the Titan, and even if it doesn't beat the Titan, if it can even come anywhere near the Titan and be hundreds of dollars less, fantastic are going to be embracing that and enjoying it and being a reviewer myself. And you know what it's like when you get new tech stuff, then you have shit to really talk about. Yes. When you're on your 10th card of your launch, you're like, okay, it's the 10th <laughs> card. But now this is fresh. This is exciting. And I'm looking forward to it. And I know the AMD fans are looking forward to it as well. I'm, so, I'm super stoked into bringing the pricing thing. Newegg had their little yes, there was on. a little snafu on Newegg. I don't know if you saw this or not, but go go ahead. So so they had a pre-order listed, and a, a, whenever this happens, there's always that dude yeah. that decides to go check out like the 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 code, the code. For, the, for the forum or or for the forum or web page or whatever it is. There's always that dude that goes and finds whatever that isn't supposed to be there. So seven hundred dollars plus, but then they could pull. A switcheroo, like has happened in the past. NVIDIA did it with GTX 680. 
where pricing was going to be $6.99 and launch day, boom, it was $5.99. So they shocked everyone from AMD to their retailers to their partners with a much more aggressively priced part than we were expecting. Um, based on what we've seen from the leaked benchmarks on Tech Power Up, performance looks very close to the Titan. However, I would take these results with a ginormous grain of grain salt. Grain of salt. Yes. Not only because it's pre-release, but I mean, come on. Okay, Elric. How many times have you run <laughs> surround benchmarks only to discover that it is a freaking nightmare? Yeah, it's most of the time just getting the setup on it's a pain in the butt. You can get it done, but those numbers to me are a little bit questionable right out of the gate. I'm waiting till we really see what goes on with it. I mean, now, now I really do think, though, that the card is going to be very, very competitive. AMD wouldn't have held their cards so close to their sleeve if they didn't have something that was going to come out to compete. And these guys are known to be the price competitors. So if they just play their cards right, AMD can do a serious damage to the market, especially here around the holiday season. Oh, play their cards. <laughs> Oh, hey -o. that's all right, man. I love that. I didn't catch that one. You know, what happened there, the guys? Buttons. You guys sound like you fell off the planet. Did you guys fall over? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I was just, I was, I was laughing. I love that. Play your cards right. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. So, <laughs> rumored specs has the die size. It was a double whammy. <laughs> Rumored specs have the die size of the 290X at higher than the 7970. Now, we saw AMD revise their strategy significantly with the release of the 3870, where NVIDIA remained committed to the gigantic monolithic GPU that was extremely expensive to engineer, produced a lot of heat, and was extremely expensive to build and put on yeah. cards. When AMD said, no, our strategy is going to be multi-GPU for the future, Future. We're going to build smaller GPUs and our flagship part will always be two of them together. Do you see a larger die than what we saw on Cayman XT, which was the 7970, 7950 series as a departure from that strategy? And what does this mean? To be honest with you, Linus, during that a lot of that last thing, I couldn't hear most of it. Would it? I'm sorry, oh. if I apologize, everybody. Can, can you re-say a lot of it? Because I couldn't hear you guys. It broke up really bad on the Skype connection. Oh, shoot. Sorry about that. Okay. So do you see AMD's new GPU, which is rumored to be much larger than the 7970 GPU in terms of die area? Do you see that as, a, as an admission of defeat on their strategy of having two smaller GPUs, so 3870X2, 4870X2, two smaller GPUs together make up their high-end strategy? Um, I, I think that AMD is just trying to stick to what they know best and trying to like get the technology to be smaller and smaller and smaller always causes some type of problems. These guys right now really just wanted to get a cards and cards out there that could seriously compete with NVIDIA since we guys all know the Titan is so far just sucked the market up. So I think AMD is just trying to really stick to what they know right now. I think in launches that we see next year with new stuff, we'll see them go back to that again. But I think right now they're just trying to really stick with what they know. Yep, I agree. I agree 100%. Now, I wanted to move on to this as a separate topic, but I guess this segues in really, really well. Do you feel like NVIDIA has been holding back for the last two years? Um, yes, for a fact. I mean, everybody that I see at NVIDIA is constantly on vacation. Like, you guys all know Del Rizzo. Every time I see him, he's on vacation with his husband around the world sending me a postcard saying, hey, we love the world. If the company really wanted to be that competitive, I think we'd be see these guys doing a lot more launching and a lot more talking about their product. They seem to be right now in cruise control, just kicking back and waiting to see what AMD's move is. Now, of course... Oh, sorry, go ahead. We called this out, like, a while ago. Actually, we, we've called this out repeatedly because we just we've we've known they've been sitting on this chip for so long. Just going, oh, here's another little, bit. oh, there's another little bit. You, that's all you need. Don't worry about it. They're just kind of sitting there. It's, so yeah. for those of you who aren't familiar with the history, GTX Titan or GK110 is the code name. It's the same GPU that's in GTX 780. The rumor was that that was always supposed to be the successor to the GTX 580. That was supposed to be the GTX 680. But the rumor, the word on the street 
Street is that NVIDIA saw how poorly 7970 performed, and remember this was AMD's strategy of smaller cores and then putting two of them together for the high end, which they didn't even manage to do until a year nope. plus into that product launch. Um, so when NVIDIA saw how poorly it performed, they basically went, well, we don't even have to release this as a GeForce GPU. And they took what would have been GTX 660 Ti, GTX 660 class of product, the GK104 GPU, and turned that into their high-end product and basically sat on GK110, um, you know, deployed it in supercomputing applications, Tesla, and um, so, so the the basically the rumor is that had Nvidia or had AMD managed to release something like R9 290X, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, we would things have things would have been different. We yeah. would have seen we wouldn't have seen a thousand dollar GTX Titan. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with you 100%. NVIDIA's had no reason to come back up and swing, and it really wouldn't make much sense for them either. If they came out with some card now that was super, super fast, they would put their competitor almost completely out of business, and that really wouldn't make sense for them either. They don't really want AMD to go anywhere. They just want to beat them, and they're doing that, and they don't have to do much. Like I said before, these guys would not be out on vacation and doing everything if they wanted to compete. They'd be in the lab talking to their engineers and talking to all of us about something new. I I don't know about you folks, but I haven't heard about anything crazily new coming out. And the, the thing about, I mean, the thing that the viewers need to understand, because, you know, viewers, a, a lot of the time I feel like don't understand the market dynamics as well as they would if they were part of the industry. So the things that viewers need to understand is that it costs a certain amount to make a card whether it's to engineer a new chip or put a complicated VRM design on it or a heatsink. I mean, the heatsink on GTX 780, GTX Titan, costs, I think, something in the neighborhood of $70 to $80. That's a bomb cost on that heatsink. It's extremely expensive to produce something like that. So there is an actual cost to producing graphics cards. Uh, but so Linus, it looks good, man. It does look good, and I love it. But I mean... Everybody likes reference cards from those guys. For the first time ever, NVIDIA made reference cards that people actually wanted more than other cards. That's a different change for those guys for sure, though. So the perception from consumers that more competition just drives pricing down is actually wrong. More competition drives a product out of the market, potentially, if it costs too much to continue to make it versus how much they can actually sell it for compared to everything else that's out there. So if NVIDIA turned around and released Maxwell to Tomorrow, which is their upcoming architecture, and it was twice as fast as the R9 series, it's not like they could charge, you know, uh, $1,500 or $2,000 for the top-end card. It might be lucrative in terms of the profit margin on the card, but it wouldn't be lucrative in terms of the volume they could turn. So it's a balancing act where AMD and NVIDIA are constantly playing this game where they actually carefully, unless they do something crazy like 8800 GT, they actually carefully slot in a new card so that it performs about like the old ones except a slightly better value and, it's, and it makes sense. Uh, we very rarely see the market completely upset these days. So um, from a business standpoint, if you can't get as much for your card because people just don't have that much money as it would be worth compared to everything else that's in the market and what your competitor can deliver, why do you release something new? Yeah, for NVIDIA, there's really no reason at all for them to release any new product right now. They can kind of cruise, even with even if this card comes out and it's really close, they can still say in the long run, hey, our card's faster, we're going to charge that money, and they can wait another generation to launch their cards. Plus, from what we've heard, they do have two more cards that are possibly going to be coming out, so we may see something new from them very soon. Why don't you give the details on those cards, because we haven't talked about them at all. Hit us. Um, well, there's supposed to be a, a single GPU card coming out and another dual GPU card coming out from NVIDIA. Um, the rumors are flying. There's nothing you know, concrete that I've actually heard from them directly, but we've seen the leaks around the world, so we know that something's definitely going to be coming. All these guys are doing right now is sitting back once again. They're going to wait for the launch. They're going to see how it affects them, and then they'll make a decision. If there's nothing that they need to do, they're going to even hold back on releasing any new cards until probably we may see something right at the holiday season, but if not, it'll be in Q1 of 2014. 
So I actually just linked to uh, your article here. So the, guys, this is on techoftomorrow.com and it, the article is NVIDIA cutting video card prices in October to compete with AMD with a question mark on it. You know, allegedly, you know, rumoredly. Um, rumor. Rumor. That, that question mark. Where Elric basically says, well, look, we might see a full-fledged Titan. Not all of the SMX modules and CUDA cores are enabled on the GTX Titan right now. We might also see, and this has been rumored by NVIDIA themselves, a dual GK 110 GPU, which would be absolutely benchmark crushing. I mean, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. Um, with that said, for all the viewers that are kind of about to ask me and about to hit my PM inbox, Linus, how do you think it will perform? The answer is very <laughs> simple. It'll perform fast. <laughs> fast. Just like two GK 110s in SLI on separate cards. Pretty much like that. So there's, there's not a whole lot of special sauce to, to, to go on here. Yeah, but NVIDIA has actually contacted me and said, hey, you know, get ready to have these cards. So they might be something that they have on paper. They might even have them, but they're not yet really sharing them with the market and saying, hey, these cards are for sure coming. Because believe me, as soon as they do, you know we'll know. Well, NVIDIA used to be pure... Uh, pure, you know, consumer graphics cards. Whereas you look at some of their initiatives now, something like Grid already uses dual GK110 GPUs on a single PCB. So NVIDIA has become, and you look at Titan, same thing, yeah. become more about delivering an enterprise solution and, and trickling that technology down to the consumer, which is a reversal from what we saw from them before. So I wouldn't be surprised if they are just sitting there waiting for AMD to do something and they just, you know, get a consumer friendly looking heatsink and redesign the IO to actually have some ports on it and release something along the lines of that card. Now, did you guys hear that in all of the two ADX cards that are coming out, they're not supposed to have any reference models whatsoever? I'm hearing, I'm hearing that every card is supposed to have its own cooling from the company. So instead of using a car with a sticker on it, I'm hearing that all of the new two ADX cards will be specifically designed by the company that's making them. You guys heard that as well? I hadn't heard that, but I do know that our sample 290X um, is a non-reference card, and I haven't heard of anyone who has gotten a reference card. So while AMD did have reference cards at the event in Hawaii, um, I, haven't, I haven't seen any yet, so that could very well be true. With that said, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about what do you think of reference cards versus non-reference cards, because this is a question that we get a ton of. Um, I think it really matters on like who is making the reference card because I'm a company will take a reference card and they'll put sorry, like, sorry, to um, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. We're getting a we're getting some some breaking up on the call here. Can we try redialing you here? Let's try that one more time here. Sorry, guys. Uh, our connection looks good. The stream seems to be running just fine still. So um, just I was to, going for a minute. <laughs> just I'm to, just to be clear, guys, uh, we still have our Razer Lower Third down here, but the Razer Comms sponsorship is technically over, and Elric had Skype on his machine, so we, we decided to go that route. So you're back, right? I'm here. But you still got that robot sound. I wonder what's going on here. It sounds like oh, you might oh. be being DDoSed, actually, would be my suspicion. <laughs> my comms broke. That's actually why I didn't use it. But oh. I can try and see if the I hear you guys work. clear. Yeah, I think uh, I think you might be being DDoSed. So, um, do you happen? Hmm. Okay, let's see if we can figure out what we yeah, can do here. Yeah, isn't actually. Oh, there we go. Hold on. Have we got? Has has the connection dropped completely? No, I'm we here. can hear him. Still there. Okay. Well, I'm here. You know what? Why don't you go ahead and sort of we'll see if we can power through it and give us a, you know, what would be, do you, how good of a data plan do you have on your phone? Do you want to give us a call from your phone on a mobile network and see if we can, we can avoid this? Um, um, I, I, I suppose I, uh, I, I, I'm in my house. I thought this was a good connection. Um, they say that I'm being DDoSed or something. Yeah, it's a, it's a Skype bug. Um, yeah. There's really not a whole lot that can be done about it, but anyone who knows your Skype ID uh, is able to, uh, to DDoS you with impunity. It was a problem we were running into on the WAN show where uh, 
our shows were getting shut down because someone who knew our Skype ID was uh, was shutting us down. In fact, that Usually person's that person's probably trying to DDoS us right now. But don't worry, we're using a very secret Skype ID that gets used for nothing but this. So, uh, you know, so I've been I've been hacked. <laughs> Basically, yeah. So you guys want me to try to hang up this and then call you back? You know what? Is that what you're saying? It's a little bit better now. Why don't you give us the reference versus non-reference card bit and let's, All right, let's uh, try it. Let's let's try it. Let's see if you can make All it. Right. All right, but check it out. Here's my way. Now, in the past. Are you guys still there? Oh yeah. Okay. In the past. I thought NVIDIA made some of the worst reference coolers around. You guys all know, everybody called them lawnmowers and everything else. They were super, super loud. In fact, everybody kind of suffered from it. Do you remember the 7950 GX2? How could you not? <laughs> but, but, like, but like I was saying, man, like NVIDIA now makes a reference card that has a really nice cooler on it. And many of the people in my channel will come to me and say, hey, how do you get a hold of that reference design exactly like that? And, and that time it was really cool. But most of the time when companies just take and put some a piece of plastic on it and throw a sticker on it, I mean, I suppose that's okay if you're just somebody throwing it in, in a computer and not looking at it. But most of the people I think nowadays are getting Oh boy, yeah, no, he's uh, definitely, definitely being DDoS, so maybe maybe try and bring the connection back. In the meantime, guys, I would love for you to hit us up on Twitter, give us a Twitter blitz of any questions you have for Elric that you'd like him to address live on the screen. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and move into one of our other topics while we try and get Elric back. I've got someone asking me on uh, on Twitter, do you even know what DDoS is? It's just Skype being garbage. Uh, the reality of it is Skype's what? service really just isn't actually that bad. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably not that. So do we have you back? Are you back? I am here. I don't know how much you guys got, but uh, I'm here. All right, you're back. So uh, we made it to, you don't see much of a value to board partners just taking a reference design and slapping a sticker on it uh, versus actually designing their own card. Most of the time, I don't really think that's good because, I mean, unless you're just somebody who doesn't care about your computer and you just want to throw it in there and play some games, you want a card that's going to look good, it's going to be cool, going to have overclocking and all that stuff. And when these guys go out of their way and they make Windforce, Twin Frozer, Asics, when they make this extra cooling and go that extra mile, it just seems to make the card be a better card and look better. And for the 5 or $10 that should pay a difference, I think the people who take the time to do that are making a better card. Now, there are some people, however, who have contacted me, like I said, who they really want to get their hands on the reference cards just like they look from NVIDIA. You can get those, for obviously, from EBGA. They have those. But there's still some people that just made a plastic shroud, even for some of these newer cards. And I don't really appreciate that. I think it's better if you go out of your way and take the time to make a better card. You're not the reference guy. Take the time to make a good card. Yep. You know what? I agree with you 100% because there was a time a few years ago when you were looking at paying a lot of the time for a non-reference card as much as you would pay for the next better GPU. So we yeah. were getting, you know, redesigned cards that are a lower tier of product, and then we were getting them sold to us at the price of a higher tier of product with performance that was about the same, but they'd be overclocked already, and yeah, you'd have a little bit more headroom out of them, but usually you were better off just buying a better GPU in the first place. Whereas now, it's like you said, it usually costs like what, an extra 10 bucks? 15 bucks to get something like a direct CU2 or a Windforce or um, or a, a Twin Frozer card that has better cooling. And in the case of direct CU2 in particular, um, Asus has done a great job of having completely non-reference redesigned cards ready at launch a lot of the time. Yep, so I, I think there's a, a very compelling value to be had there. Uh, the only Asus case... takes a lot of time. But Asus takes a lot of time. Sorry, we can't uh, we we can't make you out again, but um, you know what? I think uh, we're we're getting we're getting some we're getting some complaints here on the stream about just how bad the voice quality is. You know what? I'm sorry. We might have to let you go, Elric. Um, is he is he still able to hear me through? Probably I, not. I, he can hear I'm us here. fine. Yeah, I hear you guys fine. Sorry. You're breaking up too bad. So you know what? Um, thank you so much for coming on as a guest. Um, since they can't really hear you, I'll, I guess what I'll have to do is uh, just kind of do your outro for you. Hey, I hope you can hear that. And game, we're showing we can get this and then 
Boom. Sorry, man. We got nothing. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna have to. Let's do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll cut it, but do an outro for him. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, just so you know, that's Elric. He's got over two hundred thousand subscribers on the YouTubes, which is all the more impressive because he had to restart his channel. He got a lot of support from his viewers, formerly on the YouTube.com/slash/motherboardsorg channel. They have flocked over there. They have helped spread the word, and it is now at the point where Tech of Tomorrow has. More more subscribers than the motherboards.org channel ever had and uh, he is he is definitely he's got faster growth than ever before and I think it's uh, I think it's a really cool um, I think it's a really cool example of how youtubers can basically come back and with the support of their communities can really make a go of it in spite of some some really challenging stuff that happened uh, quite a few months ago it must have been about 10 months ago now to uh, to Elric yeah it was because it was right around yep. the time that we went indie yeah. so guys you can follow him at tech tomorrow on YouTube or you can go over to techoftomorrow.com and uh, check him out so parents minecraft is um apparently a big problem so this was a post on kotaku which uh i mean oh come on okay so <clears throat> now we've heard it all minecraft blamed in school violence case it should be noted that the kid took an unloaded gun to school and there, there was no there to 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 give a little bit to the guy who's an idiot, there was no firing pin in the gun. The kid should not have been able to get a pistol with a yes. with ammo, but there at least was no firing pin. So there was no firing pin, however, the kid did have a steak knife and a small handled sledgehammer. So arguably, as far as things that we'd consider to be weapons go, the only one was a gun. And then as far as things that we'd consider to be functional weapons go, the sledgehammer and the knife are probably actually the most potent out of everything. With that said, threatening with a gun is, is a very big deal, yeah. but the kid never actually um, Didn't threatened anyone. Yeah. So, so he had them at school, which is terrible, and the kid basically says... <clears throat> Well, they use hammers to dig and knives and guns to protect themselves from zombies. When this was asked, the... not the kid. Yeah, this was the... wait, what? I'm pretty sure that was the dad, was it not? Yeah, that was the dad. Yeah. So, I thought, oh, I thought you were saying that that was the radio station. So, so when the dad was interviewed, he clearly didn't have a very clear understanding of, of how Minecraft works, how Minecraft works <laughs> because digging is normally done with a shovel. Or, and mining is done with a pickaxe. Or he doesn't understand how digging and mining work, because I don't know anyone who digs or mines with it. So, I mean, yeah. really what this calls into question is the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the comprehension of situations of He's people. trying, he, he, he took his situation, he sat there and went, okay, everything that went wrong was kind of my fault. Now... What is applicable that I can throw poo at to make this look bad instead of me? And just randomly was like, he plays video games. Everyone blames video games. I'm going to blame video games. And I mean, I personally, <sighs> you know, as a parent now, uh, do I think that something like Grand Theft Auto V is something that I want my kid playing? The answer is no. I was, I was going to say, hopefully no. The answer is no. And you know what? I don't even, I'm not even of the mind that, you know, at 16 or 18 necessarily that people should be influenced by that kind of media. With that said, there's worse out there that isn't in a video game. This much is true. And with that said, I'm a pretty firm believer in the whole nurture versus nature, and I lean more towards the nature side. Do I believe that playing a violent video game takes an otherwise fuzzy, warm, would never hurt a fly person and turns them into a serial killer? The answer is no. Do I think that some desensitization goes on? The answer is yes, and you're you're basically wrong if you don't think that desensitization is a thing. But desensitization also doesn't make you do anything. It right. just makes you not necessarily react in crazy ways. So the witness. one thing that, that does bother me is I do think that there is probably, potentially, and I'm putting a lot of stuff in here. Probably, that, maybe, potentially. I think that if you lean that way in the first place, you might get a few interesting, cool ideas 
that you could go ahead and act on that you might not have otherwise thought of. But not really from Minecraft. No, not from Minecraft. That's ridiculous. No, they, like a, a sword. And my thing was like a sword and a bow and arrow, if you can translate his whatever the heck that he brought up. What what kid didn't carve their toast into a sword and sword fight with their brother? Like, 100%. What kid doesn't go to camp and sharpen the end of a stick and like poke random have, things? You know, sword fights. Or whatever. And, like, you know, what, you're a kid. Yeah. Like, come on. So... Any media, any book you've, like, ever read, ever, has some sort of... There's there's the the mice, whatever that book was called, but the mice have little swords and shields and stuff. Like, it's, right. it's just... It's, I think it's, it's like thing. Redwall or whatever, yeah. like that series. Yeah, anyway. like, it's just... Anyway, this on. doesn't deserve any more of our attention. Let's move on to... Ah, yeah. This surprised the crap out of me. I can't believe they're shipping Titans. I had no idea that this was the approach Valve was going to take. So they're talking about the prototypes that they're going to send out 300 of to Lux lucky folks who oh, potentially very lucky potentially very lucky folks who apply to participate in the prototype test of Steam's Steam Box gaming console that's going to have the Steam OS on it and there are okay so the 300 prototype units will ship with the following components <clears throat> some will have Nvidia Titans some will have GTX 780s, some 760s, and some 660s. So we're talking mid-range to high-end GPUs. I was really expecting Steambox to be more of a value-oriented Remember, though, thing. What, what, what I brought up last week is that Valve, the Steambox from Valve, if you buy a Steambox from Valve, it's going to be heavily customizable, so it's going to be a desktop PC, and it's going to come with baller hardware. That's been the idea. Then everyone else will have size or um, value like price or, or low power consumption or low power consumption sure that kind of stuff valve is going for the beast machine pcs which is probably not going to sell as many in my opinion so but, these uh, are but i mean valve has such brand equity that, too, that they could say well look no if you want the ultimate steam box experience you can get it this way or you can go work with a third party or you can build your own or whatever but we're valve so if you want one built by us boom boom exactly and, and, and something that's been interesting is boutique system builders we kind of brag on it every once in a while because it's so hard to effectively be a boutique system builder. This might be the only point in time where it makes sense. Because if you yeah. build uh, Steam machines, you're getting into an audience where they don't want to build their own computer, yeah. potentially. Yep. And they want something that's not an HP. Yeah. So and they want something that's built for that application, so it might make more sense. The rest of the specs look great as well. Intel 4770s or 4570s. There's going to be some i3s. Storage is going to be a 1 terabyte slash 8 gig hybrid SSHD. It sounds like Seagate's drive mm -hmm. um, in all likelihood. Power supply will be an internal 450 watt because Valve actually understands that you don't need a 1200 watt power supply even to power something like a Titan. Gold although, rated. Although 450 watt is probably borderline for a 4770 and a Titan. Um, and then finally, 16 gigs of RAM. So they are really going balls to the walls on the hardware here, which leads us into, unless you had something else to say about Valve's just, prototype. Just the Titan thing is that they're, they're not going to be, uh, I don't think any of these, like, I think what they're expecting is that if you're getting a prototype, that if you, they're saying fully customizable, right? Yeah. So if you want to overclock like crazy and do heavier things on it, that you could put in a bigger power supply, probably. Because okay. it's fully customizable. Because I think what but they're the prototype is, has to work out of the box. I, mean, I think it'll work. Okay. That'll work. All right. So uh, XI3 to unveil the piston. So this is apparently going to be shipping as soon as, what was it, mid-November? November, yeah. Mid-November for folks who pre-ordered them a while ago. And late November, like the end of November, I think the 29th for folks who want to order one now. So they are saying, okay, it's a powerful gaming system. However, powerful is very relative. It yeah. is not that powerful compared to what Valve will be shipping as prototypes because this is going to be what I'd consider to be more like... Um, more like a next-gen console in terms of CPU power, but the GPU power will actually be less. This is an APU-based machine. Yep. So here you can see what it looks like. Um, APU-based machine, it'll be powerful for its size. Yeah, it's, it's tiny. So it's four inches by four inches by four inches. Um, their website has a bunch of different pictures on it, including a dude wearing it as like a backpack. 
So you can see that right here and wearing what looks like, like a VR device and a... Interesting because of certain things that don't make sense, but kind of epic if you can make it work. It'd be awesome. Like There's no battery. Or they haven't... They, I, I looked like crazy. I spent a really long time on this topic because I was digging through everything trying to find if there's a battery. Because I'm like, how is this guy wearing it on the back? Okay, here's my, here's my suggestion. I would suggest that it uses DC in because it's going to be relatively low power. And if that were the case, you saw that huge external battery that Edsel bought, right? A uh, 25,000 milliamp hour battery. You could buy a half a dozen of them, daisy chain them, and you could... It's, if you look in my notes, I was saying something I would love to do is throw this in a backpack with a huge pile of batteries. Yes. And then go into, and something I thought of, this is, we always have our like crazy off the wall theories, so this is one of mine, um, is you could go into a paintball arena or a uh, laser tag arena. Right. And have that space mapped out into the oh, thing that'd and be then so go cool. around with a gun wearing an oculus rift and have fake enemies all over the place. That would be like, so Like how cool. epic. Or even better yet, real enemies. Real, Real enemies, enemies, but then you'd have to bots? have you would, you would just have oh. to have some sort of uh, like positional tracking on the backpacks. I mean, okay, so they could say where they were. Oculus in its current form, where you connect it to a desktop PC, is fascinating. But it's this, everything else that's going to be super. Cool. This is going to be just freaking insane. So the, okay, so the piston can power up to three displays. <gasps> oh, who cares? Because the GPU is just plain not that powerful. Yeah. It's going to have I think eight gigs of RAM in its stock configuration. Yep. Uh, it's an APU. It'll, it'll blah, start blah, with blah. a 128 gigabyte SSD, but you can upgrade yeah. to two 512s. Yep, so those are just standard M SATA drives, super small, tons of I.O., so 12 USB 2 ports, display port, mini display port, all kinds of great stuff, so you can see what they've got planned there. Uh, sorry, four of them were USB 3.0 ports, and so this is, I think, um, I think this ties in really well to a topic that I was talking to Chris Perillo about at the airport when we were in Hawaii. And I got a lot of flack in the comments under his video, which I basically said uh, PS4, Xbox One is the last generation of dedicated gaming consoles. There's people in dedicated gaming media that have said that. I don't know if okay. you've heard this. So, so hold on. So. The people that were arguing with me seem to have largely not watched the video. Because mm. what they're saying is, mobile will never replace the big screen experience with a controller. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. He's a dedicated console. At all. I said a dedicated box for console. I had one guy say, well, this guy's an idiot because it might be something integrated into your TV. Yeah, I said that in the video. <laughs> Cons the, the couch gaming experience isn't going away. No. That would be a stupid thing to say. That would be ridiculous. What I said is that if this generation of consoles has a life cycle that's as long as the last one yeah. of about eight years, we will have outgrown it by eight years from now. There's people speculating ten years, and in ten years, if your phone can't plug in to your TV and power the whole thing, what were we doing for 10 years? Yes, you look at how quickly it's moving right now compared to the, the compared to the speed at which larger devices are moving. We're moving towards smaller cores that are very powerful but also very power efficient and that's where all the development's going. Nobody gives any cares about building a new cell processor. Yeah. Okay? So, no, I'm not saying you're not going to sit on your couch with a controller and play games. People will still do that. That will, that will pretty much always be a thing. But to imagine that you need a dedicated device that exists just for playing games on your TV in eight years is ridiculous. So I really think that platforms, like I suggested in the video, that Android or iOS could potentially take a chunk of this. And people are like, oh, the, the game devs will continue to develop for Vita. Come on. What? The, the, Nintendo's still going to exist as a hardware manufacturer in eight years? Are you kidding me? Good luck. I challenge you, Nintendo, because platforms like open platforms like Android will attract game developers. We have seen. Uh, who was it? Someone's I can charging. See, I can see devices from Nintendo running Android. Sure. That, that's actually. I had a talk with a friend about. But that this would not be long ago. that would be like that would be a rebranding exercise more than anything else. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, fine, fine, fine. But to suggest that closed platforms will continue to be a thing, I think is ridiculous. We've seen already. I think it was fifteen dollars was the most expensive game on the App Store, and it's selling. So no. 
you don't have to develop for, and, and we can prove that you don't have to develop for a closed platform, and all of a sudden, anyone on their phone or TV or Shield or whatever else can consume your game, you're gonna be hitting so much larger of an audience. What do game devs look for? They look for where are people willing to spend money? People love buying apps. And they look for where is a large install base? Why do you develop for Xbox 360? Because there's millions of them out there. Why do you develop for Android versus Windows Phone? because there's millions of them out there. The install base for Android will completely eclipse anything that PS4 or Xbox One combined could hope to accomplish eight and, years from now, in and, fact, probably already. And we're gonna look at cell phones that you will own in not that long that will be more powerful than that console that you own. Yes. That is going to happen. So when I brought up plugging your phone into the TV, that's because your phone will be better than the console that you also have plugged into the TV. So there you go, guys. Yes, it'll hold on, and yes, this generation of consoles will continue to exist, but, and, and you know what? Okay, may, maybe we'll see one more, but I don't think it'll be that successful. I don't think it'll be that big of a deal. That's, that's another thing, like Nintendo not making their own device, like they might still be making their own device. It might be side by side, like there might yep. be a dedicated Nintendo One or, and an Android One, or they might just be struggling along. It just won't be on the scale it currently. Or is. we might see we might see some kind of an evolution where um, games happens. could be platform specific, like Nintendo could lock down Nintendo games to only run on their Android thing. I, I don't see that happening though. Um, I, I could see it happening. I don't know why they would. It'll all come down to game devs though, and I mean people making the argument in the comments as well that oh yeah huh, I'm gonna replace my GTA Five gaming experience with Angry Birds. Yeah, Angry Birds isn't the only game that runs on Android. Like, let's get over that. Let's just and move we, past that. We don't have GTA 5 running on Android, but at some point it will be It will able be capable to... of doing it. Yeah. And if there's money to be made by doing that, I mean, you'd be crazy as a game dev to not develop for a platform where people will throw buckets of money at you. So. One of the main reasons why I was interested in Ubuntu Edge back to throwing way back to this was because sure. once you plugged it into a computer, or a, a monitor and it detected that setup was going on, it, it would completely change. It would boot into Ubuntu Desktop OS instead of Ubuntu Mobile OS. And I found that fascinating because you can plug your phone into a screen that's bigger than it and it still sucks. Because yeah. it's a mobile OS and it's all weird and whatever. Absolutely. But if it boots into a desktop OS, how about you plug your phone into your TV, it boots into a console OS. Sure. And we've seen glimmers of that with Android already in things like the uh, Asus Transformer. Yeah. Where, okay, yeah, yeah, mouse keyboard support, sure, yeah, have a more desktop-like experience. Uh, there's no reason, I mean, eight years. It's a really long time. It's a really long time. Like, in eight years, we've seen smartphones come into existence. Yeah. To where we are today. Like, like when you just think eight years, it doesn't seem like that long, but actually go back and look, try and figure out what tech you owned eight years ago. Yeah. And then just be like... It's laughable. So, okay, let's move into our next topic, because I think I've ranted about that enough. The Silk Road has been busted open. So, uh, you know what? You're, you're more into this whole stuff than me, so go ahead. To, to first explain what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a website on the quote-unquote... People hate it when I say quote unquote, quote, darknet, unquote, there we go. Um, <laughs> I got called out for that a ton when I stream. Um, that, that, that uses bitcoins and a weird way of transferring bitcoins to sell drugs or narcotics. So they or would sell, fake IDs. Or fake IDs or anything that you would sell on the black market, quote unquote, um, would, would go on this website. So the idea of it was that you could only access it through a Tor network. It was a dot .onion website, so it wasn't dot .com. They have a weird, crazy URL, um, which is in the doc for people that are interested, but wouldn't exactly suggest going right now. Um, and like, it, it, users would connect to it by going behind a proxy, so like Hotspot, Hotspot Shield or something, and then Tor up behind that, and then they'd be able to access the website. So it was below layers of security. And the and idea was that everyone, sellers, buyers, owners, was completely anonymous. Yeah, and, and that helps. And these these dot onion websites, how all they work and all that kind of stuff, it's tons of anonymity. And then even the way that the bitcoins are transferred in between people helped because you know Bitcoin transactions are traceable. They're traceable. So the way that they went around was in this weird. It was loopy like scrambled way. or something. Yeah. So so you could you could follow it, but it was really confusing, and it was pretty much impossible to find who it actually ended up with. Blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So what happened was the, not the original creator, but the guy that took it over, 
Um, so that's Ross Ulbricht. Or or what was his what was his tag? Dread Pirate Roberts. There we go. Yeah, as a as a throwback to an an old movie. Um, I love that movie. It's awesome. Yeah, it's one of your favorites. Yes, I think I, some people will know what we're talking about. Princess Bride. Yeah, there. Um, sorry, I wasn't gonna say. Yeah, so he he has posts on like Stack Overflow, which I linked in the document, which you guys can check out, which is just like K, and like people knew it was him, and he's talking about like securing Onion websites, and it's just like. Okay. And then in, in PMs to a few users, he put his, his personal email address, which had his name on it. So it's like, K. Okay. And then the FBI has been on him forever. The, he, he tried to place two hitman contracts through FBI agents, not knowing that they're FBI agents. He tried to buy a kilogram of coke through FBI agents. Like, he, for, 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 for running this, like, super secret crazy thing that tons of people were on, where's... My metrics. There's 146,000 unique buyer accounts. Now, in saying that, there was almost a million accounts. It's just 146,000 unique buyer accounts. These people that actually put through transactions. And there was 9 million bitcoins transferred through this thing. If you break that down, that's, as far as I know, like billions of dollars. 1.2 billion today yeah. would be the, uh, yeah, so the sales revenue of more than 9.5 million bitcoins valued at 1.2 billion. And, and people figured out that was like, a huge percentage of all Bitcoin transactions yeah, going on. Yeah, I think it was something like half. Yeah, so <laughs> we're so we're through this website. When this got when this got when the, when he got busted, um, Bitcoin fell by twenty nine percent immediately, which is like wow for people that were trying to keep Bitcoin up on the up and up and like the good kind of situation. You just lost a lot of. Points. And it's one of those things where we you know we look at Bitcoin and we kind of go yeah great idea yep. but. If you're ever going to be legit, this kind of crap isn't going to help. Because, because all people are going to see it for it. Because they had this whole... The mentality behind the site was that they thought that all of this should be okay and should be legal. And they were trying to make their own way of doing it. Like, it, it had a philosophy. underlying philosophy. Yeah. And that's going to be completely ignored now. That it's been busted open and the runner was trying to get people killed. Because that's what people are going to focus on. Yeah. Um, so your whole underlying philosophy just got blown the crap up. And it's 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 now everyone is going to hear about this. It's huge on the news, and yep. all it says is Bitcoin is bad. So that's a, a real shame. It is. It's actually. I mean, I think we should look at this as it, just from sort of a thousand foot view. What a shame! Uh, what a shame for Bitcoin. What a shame for alternative currency in general. Because you know, even even other currencies like Litecoin are going to suffer yep. as a result of the negative image of Bitcoin. And I mean, it's one of those things where we look at it and we go, well, the whole point is we want to get away from governments dictating what we can or cannot buy, where we can and cannot spend our money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is that it seems, you know, like if I say this, I think it will be true. Uh, it seems like uh, if people want to avoid having the government snooping in their affairs, well, this is what they're doing. Well, okay. Could and that for half of the people using Bitcoins, it was true, at least. The, the drug thing aside, because there's so many laws changing in that field right now. That's so true. Whether, whether or not you think it's bad or not, completely ignoring that, I think the part where it really stepped over the line was where he's trying to get people killed. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. So it just um, so 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 that's the perception that will be that will exist for half of all the transactions that were occurring using Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I think... and that's that's all allegedly. We haven't confirmed that number through yeah. investigative journalism that half of the transactions were. But but uh... I, I think part of that too is because of the kind of back loopy way that they're doing transactions. They bounced around a lot. Right. So uh, that inflated the number like crazy. But still, nine million bitcoins. It wasn't a small amount. So, yeah. yeah. So one of the, uh, the so he actually ended up getting busted due, due to a, ran, a random routine uh, package inspection where he was having some fake documents shipped over the border. And uh, the, so there was one of them was a California driver's license with his photograph and birth date, but a different name. So they ended up being able to put enough of it together that they were able to, to bust him. The Canadians ended up catching him. And one thing that is kind of go Canada sucky in this is go Canada, but a huge amount of the transactions and a huge amount of people on the website were Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's go Canada. Uh, kind of. <laughs> uh, yeah. Alrighty then, we have a fantastic, uh, well, we have a fantastic sponsorship message for you before we start talking about cheating in Android benchmarks. And I almost feel a little bit sort of weird talking about this right now, but um, 
Whatever your reasons might be, <laughs> and there are legitimate reasons yeah. to value your privacy on the internet, Seriously, with all the NSA crap going on right now, just because you're not buying drugs online doesn't mean that you shouldn't value your privacy. Um, VPNs are a great solution, and Hotspot Shield is the proud sponsor of the WAN show for this week. So basically, guys, you can visit bit.ly slash hsshare for 20% off your el any elite prices on new accounts. You can get a trial of the software, of course, and try it out before you buy. And what's the value of a VPN? You, you can do things like we just talked about, where you can... No, not the buying drugs part. No, I, I didn't... I, <laughs> I meant at the beginning where I was like, to hide your footsteps and all that. Kind of stuff and maybe you're not buying drugs maybe you're trying to talk about something that you don't want other people to know about and that might not actually be an inherently bad thing so you want to trace your steps um, not everything that's illegal is necessarily bad i mean we've seen this time and time again throughout history where not everything that i mean at times you couldn't talk about being a christian for fear of execution yeah. like talking about things is not necessarily bad so vpns can help protect your privacy underground railroad all like there's there's tons of stuff that being black been... is not inherently bad no i think we can all agree on this now but even you know a hundred years ago that wasn't a thing so anyway so so whatever your reasons be you can you can hide your footsteps you can there's there's some things i think it's just with ios where it will actually kind of help save money on your data plan because yeah. it does compression on their side. So another thing you can do with it, because all your traffic is being rerouted through their server, is you can circumvent things like region restrictions for services yeah. like Netflix. It will slow down your connection, but the only way to know for sure if you like it is go try it. So check it out, bit.ly slash hsshare. And if you do decide to buy anything, make sure that you use code Linus in order to get that 20% discount. So thanks again to Hotspot Shield for sponsoring the WAN show. And without further ado, Boom! They are <clears throat> almost all dirty by Anand Lal Shimpi and Brian Klug. So the state of cheating on Android benchmarks. So I want to preface this by saying cheating on benchmarks is not a new concept. No. Especially on the on the PC side, we have seen this over and over and over again, whether it was 3D Mark 2001, 3D Mark 2003, every graphics company was doing everything they could to have the highest score, whether it meant, oh, well, if we just like render that with a little bit less fidelity, nobody will notice. And so they were making specific optimi optimizations that they were re releasing with driver updates to 3D Mark, a synthetic benchmark. A new driver would drop and it would say 10% improvement in Far Cry, 15% improvement in 3D Mark. <laughs> and you'd just be like, come on. You guys are really investing in this. But the reality of it was, especially then, a lot of people were making purchasing decisions based on synthetics. Yep. I think more than, actually. More than. So leading us to, well, on the Android side, I would say a lot of people are making purchasing decisions based I, I on synthetics. I meant for PCs. Oh, oh, more than than now. Yeah, for yeah. PC, sure, because most people just don't care anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they tested a bunch of stuff. So the Pad Phone from Asus, the HTC One, the One Mini, the G2 from LG, the Moto Razr, and the basic conclusion, guys, is that if you're buying a Nexus device, there is no cheating going on. If you're buying a Motorola device, device it looks like at least the ones they tested no guarantees about the other ones there's no cheating going on if you are buying a samsung device look at that note 3 there is more cheating going on with the note 3 and the note 10.1 2014 edition than any other device that was tested nvidia shield is not doing any cheating but let's let's get into the technical sort of what is cheating exactly because this is a bit different this isn't driver tweaks where you're actually yeah. rendering less of the image or, or doing whatever else. So on the Exynos 5410, Samsung was detecting the presence of certain benchmarks and raising thermal limits and thus the max GPU frequency in order to gain an edge on those benchmarks. On both the Snapdragon 600 and the 5410 on the Samsung Galaxy S4 platform, so both of those, both Samsung Galaxy S4 platforms, Samsung was detecting the presence of certain benchmarks and automatically driving CPU voltage and frequency to their highest state right away, as opposed to a gradual ramp up and ramp down. And how these benchmarks work is they'll go through multiple times and then give you an overall score, so it's going to change it, the, the scale at which it changes it, if you look at it for one run, is a little bit, but then over time it actually increases. Yeah. So basically they're not they're not lying to you. 
about what your hardware is capable of doing. They're not just, you know, creating a, you know, they're not putting like a piece of software on the phone that detects the benchmark, closes it automatically, puts up a static image that makes it look like it's running it, and then just spits out a fake score. We're not talking <laughs> something that blatant. But what they're doing is they are manipulating the numbers to achieve... Unrealistic levels. Unrealistic levels of performance. And maybe it's 3% here or 8% there. It's still... It's not like doubling it, just, just fabricating the numbers completely. But it really feels unnecessary, and I wish that, that this wasn't the case. But it's going to happen, it'll keep happening, and you know why it'll keep happening? Because most people don't care. You folks watching this show, you probably already were at least vaguely aware of this. The people who we would be breaking this news to are not watching this show. And the people who might be shopping for a, a cell phone probably aren't going to listen to you when you start talking about what benchmark the HTC One wins and which one the Galaxy S4 wins because they don't care. They look at it and they go, oh yeah, this one's really nice and it has a good battery life. And... But, but what they will read into is the newscaster who quickly goes to some website, finds benchmarks, and then goes, this is the fastest phone there is, or this phone is faster than this phone without saying benchmark, without saying any of the big words. And up till now, my understanding is that Samsung has mostly just denied any optimizations so unless they're reading the verge or anon tech versus if they're watching fox news um that yeah. that tells you what kind of information they're gonna get and most sites are just gonna keep running benchmarks and that's all you can do i mean this is very low level firmware programming that's going on here to change things like power states on the fly yeah. like this so you can't just turn that off and run the benchmark to get more legit benchmarks so uh one thing they did was they renamed the executables Oh, okay. Not, I guess, it's not really, the, the, the packages. They would rename the benchmark, and then it wouldn't detect it in some situations. And then it's going to become another arms race where the, the, the phone find manufacturers some will find some way to do it. No. So, so there you go. And if you want to keep your phone up to date, you're going to have to keep installing, you know, new ROMs and new, new updates. And for everyone who's saying, oh, well, I just, you know, uh, inst I rooted my phone, I installed custody. Good for you. Most people aren't going to do that. <laughs> My mom is not going to do that. No. His mom is not going to do that. Nope. I didn't even bother on my own phone. Not because I don't know how to do it, because I just don't care. We jailbroke my mom's phone, but that was just because she needed a few more things. That's one way of putting it. Was it was like a super old phone. She needed a few more things? Oh, it was additional functionality. Ah, okay. It, we, we didn't actually pirate any apps or anything, it was just additional functionality. So Qualcomm claims that Apple's 64-bit CPU is a marketing gimmick. So this was posted by E. Chondo on the forum. The original article is from news.techworld.com. And basically they've come out and said, look, I think they're doing it as a marketing gimmick. There's zero benefit that the consumer gets from that. Um, the benefit, the main benefit of 64 bit is being able to address more than four gigs of memory. And Apple has only equipped the 5S with one gig yeah. of RAM, which means that on the 5S there is no benefit. But this comes down to the, what we were talking about before, which was what Apple's doing in my mind is preparing the ecosystem yeah for the eventual move and paving the road for a smoother transition. So I, I think I think the 64-bit chip may have been interpreted incorrectly, but I don't think it was complete hogwash and had no, no, it didn't help consumers at all. I think that's complete crap because it's preparing the whole ecosystem for later. So when they will utilize this, which will be probably pretty freaking soon, to be completely honest. Yeah, maybe another uh, year or two kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, it, it will be ready and it won't be a big deal. We saw this on the PC side where it was kind of terrible. And the difference between Apple and Android at that point then will be that Apple will be able to launch iOS 7.5 or 8 or whatever they want to call it and say backwards compatibility all the way back to 5S. Whereas the compatibility of 64-bit Android operating systems and apps will be so broken and so fragmented that no one will know what's going on unless you're one of that 0.1% that actually gives two cares about it and follows all this stuff daily, you'll know, but good for you because most people won't. And when it comes to selling to the general consumer, you have to do things that appeal yeah. to the general consumer and compatibility is a big one. So I still say like huge thumbs up to Apple. 64 yep. bit does not inherently improve the performance. The A7 chip, the A7 chip is fast because the A7 chip is fast. Yeah. 
Not because it's 64-bit, it just happens to be 64-bit compatible. And I think it's fantastic that moving forward, we're gonna, we're gonna have the market move in that direction. Yeah, I found one of the things that he said actually interesting, saying... Uh, really? How was that for you? Well, you have to let me... Finding one of the things that I said interesting. Not I mean. you. Oh, okay. I, I generally find things you say interesting. I was oh, talking about you. the guy in the, in the thing. Anyways, he, he says it, it will have no real benefit other than engineering, chip design, and operating systems. Well, wow, that sounds like a pretty compelling <laughs> I was just like, list of benefits. What? Those things are really important. Like, what are you talking about? I can't find any of those three things that is not important. Yeah, like, what? So, I, like, that quote was just like, okay, I really, like, oh, man. Like, sorry, dude, but that's brutal. <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead and move into our next iPhone piece of news. So Logitech's iPhone game controller pictured again in a new leak. This is all rumored. This isn't by any means release hardware or anything over here. But that looks pretty darn cool. It looks good, and this plays into exactly what you just brought up, which is where Nintendo might not be a... Handheld manufacturer, hardware manufacturer. Because why would they need to be? Because stuff like this is going to start coming out. And I think stuff, even though this is awesome, I think stuff a lot better than this is going to start coming out. And that's the other thing, too, is the ridiculous people posting on that video saying, oh, well, the touchscreen experience isn't very good. Good for you, the touchscreen experience isn't very good. It's not, it's not. It's not what we're talking about. Touchscreen experience, like, always sucks unless you might be a Valve and you might be changing it. Yeah, but, and you might be made of magic. Yeah, but that touchscreen experience that Valve is going to have, that's I don't touch think. That's touchpad. Yeah, that's not going to come to yeah. phones for so, at least a long time. So, you know, you look at the direction things are moving where it comes to, where we've got accessories that turn our phones into consoles. We've got dedicated devices like Shield that turn that ecosystem into a console. Oh, sorry, to throw back, another thing, Shield didn't cheat either. Yeah, Shield didn't cheat. I, I did mention that. Okay, okay. Yeah, NVIDIA know. did not cheat with the Tegra 4, and I think that really speaks to how much they've grown up. Yeah, in yeah. The, in the last five to eight years, yeah. where uh, they were as guilty as AMD at oh, times. Yeah. Like, real guilty. Yeah. <laughs> and now, here, you know, no one was really investigating this at the time, but they basically said, look, Tegra 4 kicks ass, and it's going to kick ass without us making any optimizations for particular Which is applications. really cool. Kudos to you, NVIDIA. Love to see that. All right, so here's a quick discussion topic, and that is the... <clears throat> Xeon versus Core Series processors. So there's a lot of confusion about this. So the Xeon E3... Yeah, I know I'm in Canada. I don't care. Uh, the Xeon E3... Oh, I hate it when it does that to me. Stop it. I know I'm in Canada. Don't redirect me to the homepage. I want to actually look at this page. So what is the difference between a Xeon and a Core Series processor? So there's a couple of different things. First of all, right now there happens to be a particularly interesting Xeon, which I can't remember the model number of because it's crazy. right now. And uh, of course, this, this isn't working because I bet my phone battery Your phone just, just died. died, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's one thing after another today. So it's the E3 something or other. It's clocked 100 megahertz slower than the Core Series equivalent. And what's the difference? So number one is that Xeons aren't officially supported by some boards. With that said, I've yet to see a compatible, an electrically compatible yeah. board that doesn't support it. They, they, they always work. They're just not like officially supported, but they always work. Yeah. Uh, number two is there's no integrated GPU, so Intel has fused it off because they, I guess they figure people who want those Xeons don't need integrated graphics. Which I think is crazy, because that's one okay. of the reasons I have against getting one, is if I wanted to use it for a server later on, I'd want it to have integrated graphics. Okay, <laughs> base clock overclocking only, which is fairly limited um, compared to being able to overclock the multiplier. Even on non-unlocked SKUs, you can overclock the multiplier a fair bit on modern G uh, CPUs. And on Haswell, since they don't overclock, that high <laughs> you might be getting pretty close to the maximum without even getting an unlocked CPU um, it doesn't need ECC memory but it can use ECC memory yep. unlike the core series processors um, so someone was basically just asking me uh, well is there any compelling reason why I should get a core series processor versus a Xeon if it's like 50 bucks cheaper and I was kind of like let me look into this the answer seems to be if you don't need the onboard graphics and you don't want to overclock not really yeah Make sure your board supports it. In it's, fact, many boards, even consumer ones, do officially support Xeons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just not all, just not everyone officially supports Xeons. That's yep. all. Um, but and like this has actually been pretty crazy on the forums lately. I don't know if you've noticed that, but people have been going nuts over these two processors. And like, yeah, 
if you have no plan on overclocking and you have 100% of a plan to always have a video card with that processor all the time, like you're going to pair them together, um, then yeah, it's fine. Uh, personally, I like getting processors that have integrated graphics if I'm going to get it on a non like crazy enthusiast platform. So if I'm not going to get 2011, I'm probably going to want the option for integrated graphics because at some point in time, I might take that system and throw it in a server environment. Who knows? And well, like there's other that stuff that uses it. I mean, things and like that. Uh, things like uh, video sync. encoding, yeah, quick sync. Um, anything that's going to take advantage of OpenCL is going to benefit from yep. the onboard graphics, whether it's Intel or AMD, although AMD's onboard graphics are quite a bit more powerful. Yeah. Um, and I can't find a micro USB charging cable, which means that our, um, our PowerPoint for our build of the week is going to be a bit of a challenge. So we'll be back in just a moment. Oh, we can do that. Uh, wait, where are we? Build right, week. right, you've got it. Okay. Can't see. Our builds of the week this week are freaking awesome. Awesome. So the first one is Arctic Water from B Negative, and there's nothing negative about it. Holy balls. <laughs> so this was built for someone else. Uh, I think it was on the OC3D forums, but like <sighs> when you're building something for someone else that is already on a tech forum, like you kind of know it's going to be pretty awesome. Unbelievable. I mean, even replacing all of the connectors on the PCI Express slots, painting the shroud on the Sabertooth board, painting that memory, that hard piped copper tubing. I mean, oh, it's, it's, it's orgasmic. And then once you go to the next photo, you can actually see even oh. the ring on the Corsair fans, different accent points on the Sabertooth motherboard. Like what a beautiful machine. Attention to freaking detail. What an absolutely beautiful this, this machine. This grill here. Wow. And it's the one system I've ever seen where the stock crossfire breaks. It's, like it's not completely out of place. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Next up, this one's been in the works for a long time. From really P. Long Baines, time. the custom water-cooled desk. Boom! So cool. And then one thing that I always worry about with Dem these speakers. desks. And actually, we talked about this in one of my private little, not private, but my solo live streams a while ago when this was in production, which we brought this up and everyone, instead of me playing a game, was just looking at this build, which is ridiculous. But I brought up something that always worries me about these taller desk builds, which is yeah. like, where do you where, put your what legs? What it means is like the, uh, the, the tallness of the height yeah. here. Yeah. So it's like, where do you put your legs? And then how do your arms, like if it's yeah. tall enough for your legs, are your arms up here? And he has a photo of it and he actually kind of slots in fairly well. Okay. And then he also brought up that he's going to be putting his keyboard and mouse probably on a tray anyways. Right, okay. So that totally makes sense. That's just a wicked build. Look at that sleeving and these, I love that. Nice straight runs of, of uh, um, a vinyl tubing yeah. or a flexible tubing look outstanding it looks so good oh all dim right angles and oh, man and he was even super 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 careful about the color of his coolant too it's great that's not the last picture oh oh, oh okay uh, yeah. there's, Sorry, one, there's more. one more I, it's not like a super crazy picture of the insides but i just wanted to show how like he actually does kind of fit now it's pretty tight but he yeah. did say that he's gonna he's kind of a bigger guy time. you can you can tell yeah. looking at him so some for someone like me my legs would be too low and my arms would be up here yeah but uh, it seems to kind of it seems to kind of work for him which is very very awesome what a great build yeah seriously absolutely I'm super love stoked it. to see it finished so guys i think that's pretty much it for the LAN show this week thank you so much for tuning in and uh again big thanks to our sponsor hotspot shield for making this episode possible so without further ado, peace out. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Oh, that makes sense that that didn't work. So. Is that network targeting? Yeah. Awesome. Did it just crash? Oh, no, we're here. <laughs>